Visits to Sufi Centers Some Recent Research Papers on Sufis and Sufism by Jaleddin Ansari and others Basic Teachings of the Sufis by Jaleddin Ansari A famous contemporary writer has said, For the Sufi, Sufism is more of a science than a trip. The Sufis realize that the Sufi way is far too important to be something to be enjoyed or endured. It is something to be learnt. The world is full of people who read Sufi books or meet supposed Sufis and as a result imagine that they are Sufis too. There are also so many scholars, journalists and earnest inquirers asking whether this pantomime really is Sufism that ordinary spectators easily become puzzled. When dealing with the basic teachings of the Sufis, therefore, we have to note that the primary one, if it can be put in this way, is that nobody can learn to be a Sufi without being taught by a real Sufi. Is this so very surprising? Perhaps we might see what can happen with, say, Christianity, if adopted in a random and selective manner. Quote, Things got out of hand when the three McEwen sisters had a Bible reading session. They stripped to get back to the Garden of Eden, smeared themselves with mustard and stole a van. The naked girls were arrested, and Dosheline McEwen, 30, said from jail in Lansing, Michigan, we were high on the Holy Spirit. Evening News, London, April 24, 1980, page 9. Now, you note that not only was this a matter of individual, if intrepid, do-it-yourself religion, it also spread so that it infected three people. There have been cases where such sentiments have spread even further, eventually involving millions. And even further, note that this mutual excitement process is described by one of the participants not for what it is, a way of obtaining stimuli, but is regarded as being high on the Holy Spirit. This is exactly what happens with some people who attach themselves to the Sufis, or to anything else which they can use for self-stimulation. It is not to be mistaken for Sufi activity, any more than the above anecdote reflects Christianity. Another basic teaching of the Sufis is that wherever there is a legitimate Sufi teacher, there will also be sincere and severe opposition to him. It must be admitted that history shows this to be true. Not a single one of the admitted Sufi great masters has failed to be plagued by critics and opponents. In the past, they have generally as with Europe in the Middle Ages, specialised in accusing the Sufis of heresy and opposition to religion. The Sufis themselves have devised a counter to this continuing opposition, something which is often confused with a spiritual exercise. This is the often quoted path of reproach, ra e malamat. Centuries before, the Zen masters in Japan found that you could disarm an opponent by using his strength against him. The Sufis did the same thing with words and appearances. It fitted in well with their contention that so-called reality is in any case comparative, subjective. This is how it works. Someone vilifies a Sufi. He answers, Everything that you say against me is true, and it does not even go far enough. In fact, in the nature of things, you can only have an incomplete idea of how bad I am. I am the one who knows all the secret failings and shortcomings in me, and it is I, therefore, who am an expert on my iniquity. Nobody has yet thought out a counter to that one. I visited one Sufi group in the holy city of Mecca, centre of students from all over the Islamic world. Here they were studying the works and sayings of Idris Shah, the notable Afghan spiritual guide. I said, Some people in the West and several people I have met in the East do not like Syed Idris' work. 
The sheikh, who was in charge of the meeting, immediately answered, That is a little too late, rather like a wave saying, I don't like Noah's Ark. The Ark is built, it works, it is designed to defy the waves, it succeeds. What the wave says may be interesting, it may be expected, but significant, no. The basic teachings of the Sufis are not only frequently very surprising in that they contain elements which are not to be found in systems which depend upon indoctrination or upon the recruitment of game players, emotionalists. They also find expression in areas which are completely unrecognizable as spiritual by shallower observers. Let us put it in this way, compressing somewhat the words of a Sufi teacher whom I met in Syria and who would have nothing to do with the widely advertised Sufis of that country. Since externals, beard, rosary, litanies, begging bowls, special meditation rooms, constant meetings and reliance upon miraculous tales or examples, are what attract people to Sufis and other mystics, it follows that anyone who concentrates upon having and dealing in such things can establish himself, in the eyes of the unregenerate, as a Sufi. Conversely, someone who knows the essence of Sufi experience and how to engender it cannot become established and will be considered a fraud. Following this clue led me through several years of investigations and revealed a most astonishing, to me, state of affairs. When I visited a country and showed interest in its Sufis, I became aware that a certain amount of interest was being taken in me by people who were neither agents of the police, nor what could be identified as Sufis. If I became friendly or assiduous in my interest with the supposed Sufis, these others melted away. If, however, I shunned the supposed Sufis and continued to look for people who could give me insights without externals, these people came closer. Eventually, I was able to find the real Sufis who stood behind the facade of imitators and impostors. As one of these genuine Sufis said to me, We have to be sure that you are sincere. We have to keep an eye on you to see if the robes and beards and the emotional excitement, zikr, the repetitions of holy formulas, are enough for you. If they are, we have to leave you alone, because in such a case you would have found what you sought, not the Sufis, but a source of comfort and sense of importance. I asked him, Are there, then, no genuine organization of Sufis or true Sufi masters, working in public and looking like what the superficialist imagines a man of religion to resemble? He said, Oh yes, indeed, but these few can easily be tested for genuineness. The trouble is that the disciple will never test the master. Why will he not test him? Because he does not know how. If he is pre-sold on the desire to attach himself to someone, he will not want to find out that he is wrong. As an example, the other day I asked someone who believes that he is a Sufic aspirant why he was following a certain master who is certainly a deluded psychopath. He said, He is obviously only testing me by practicing the path of blame. Now, in fact, the test is not at the level of the path of blame. I leave that aside for the moment. Never start with looking at the path of blame. That is there anyway for the profane to deflect them. Look instead at whether the master, one, can explain what he is doing by reference to the classics, two, refuses to follow a single classical teacher alone, three, can operate outside of the ritualistic without gadgets, four, refuses to mystify you and has no magical aura, five, produces no atmosphere of power around him. As the ancients have rightly said, the fraud makes people believe that he is a man of power. The true Sufi spends much time appearing very normal. And six, can work in the world and make what seem like worldly activities successful, as Kaja Ahra did.
He was a self-made millionaire, but none could say that he was not the supreme adept of the age. These are some of the qualifications and characteristics of the real Sufi teacher, whether he is a visible one or not. When I returned to Europe after that journey in the East, I made contact with a great many people whom no one would even suspect of being Sufis, or spiritual people at all. I could now recognize them because I had learnt the basic teachings which cover so much more ground than the morbid and often vacuous nonsense of those whom the world takes for religious people, especially as Sufis. Such people are so strongly represented in the West that, in little over a week, I noticed the following Sufis, without the reputation, appearing on television or writing or being interviewed in the newspapers. One conductor of classical music, three businessmen, five industrialists, three writers, one singer, two politicians, one Christian priest, and several others. Of course, the most basic teaching of all among the Sufis is that the teaching itself is produced by a teacher as a consequence of his own experience. As soon as he has had the ultimate experience, he can see from that viewpoint how to bring it to others. He has become a teacher. Now if in order to bring it to others he has to do or to say things which do not seem to be spiritual or even relevant, to those who cannot in any case judge, he will always find a way to bring the teaching to those who are open to understanding. He cannot, of course, reach everyone, and especially out of reach are those who come to him for not teaching, but for something which they respond to emotionally. It is such a teacher, the only genuine one, who will know what is and what is not relevant from the vast body of accumulated Sufic law. Most of it, of course, is only the empty cans of the nutrition that it formerly contained. I came across an interesting example of this from a Sufi teacher whom I approached to seek an explanation why certain ideas and practices endured for centuries. I hazarded the opinion that, for a practice or belief to have lasted for centuries, it must have had, must surely continue to have, some value to the culture or the individual or some useful effect on the minds of the people. Well, he said, I was recently in India in a very old palace in the jungle. Much of it had fallen down, and other parts had been undermined by exotic growths. But here and there I could see exquisite examples of artistry in the moulded stucco work, amazingly well preserved. Why did these pieces, as distinct from others, survive? Why did other parts crumble to dust? No function is being performed by the intact ones that was not inherent in the parts which had vanished. Again, much of the lime in the deteriorated parts was serving as fertilizer. This, then, is the true Sufi speaking. The imitator will try to preserve everything. Was it not Idris Shah who says somewhere that we must make a distinction between the constructive, the nutritive, and the museum keeper? Because basic teachings of the Sufis do not in fact attract, it is the non-basic, the heard, the chants, the emotion which do, the real Sufi must organize himself so as to, one, attract those who have gone beyond basics as generally understood, and two, make his contact with other people on a completely different basis. Kaja Ahra, already mentioned, not only made a colossal fortune, he operated a number of organizations in commerce, agriculture and learning, which attracted people by virtue of their success and inner energy. Then, at a later date, people would find, by contact, that there was something else within such structures. And they were then able to perceive that here was something of the spirit, of beauty, of value, and of the divine. It does not happen, except rarely, the other way about.
If you go into one of the bookshops which specialize in oriental or spiritual writings, you will nowadays be confronted by a positive barrage of books about and by Sufis. Most people have absolutely no notion of how to research this material. Familiarity with basic teachings of the living tradition, however, enables one to sort out the true from the false fairly quickly. In the first place, true and false here do not refer to intention, only to capacity. That is to say, we have to recognize that most of the writers are not so much mad or bad as sad. Scholars and self-appointed specialists tend to search for things which attract them and represent these as Sufism. They also develop a quite unsufi fervor or hostility towards those writings which do not square with their opinions. Hence, you can cut out all writings which contain polemic or personal attacks. You can, again, leave aside all the strictly symbolic or artistic attempts at representing Sufism as expressed largely or cogently through these means. Symbols and artistry in Sufism are instruments, not part of artistry or language or even communication. Then, again, you can avoid profitably all the materials which dwell on a single classical figure and his writings or doings, since these would in any case soon pall, or else condition you into a mere worshipper of that individual. See what is left, and you will probably have the real Sufi materials. Basic Sufi teachings, however, warn against premature stabilization of opinion. For every truth you find, there is another and more profound one beyond, one which may seem to contradict the first. This is a warning not to rely on written materials, however important, without a living source of information and instruction. In this connection, the following dialogue seemed of the very greatest importance to me when I heard it in a Sufi circle in Algeria. How do I know a real teacher? People who ask this question will not find the answer while they are thinking in this vein. What is the way to find the answer? To try to perceive inwardly the essence, the reality, the truth and inner being of the teacher and the teaching in all things, not just in the assumed teaching function or appearance, no matter where or who this teacher is. It is almost to be predicted that you will find it where you do not expect it. What if I make a mistake? You will certainly make a mistake if you lack sincerity. What is a sign of a lack of sincerity? The first sign is that you want to find someone who is acceptable or something which pleases you, rather than that you want to find truth, whatever that may be, wherever and whenever it might be. The Dinner Meeting and Other Topics Abdul Wahab Tirmizi or Tiriaki Tradition has it that, in very ancient times, Sufi teachers would spread a cloth by a roadside, perhaps at a crossroads, and lay out whatever food people had given them to entertain travellers. These dinner-table offerings, naturally enough, became the occasions for rest and listening to the words of the Sufis. Some of the most famous chaikanas, or tea houses, and caravanserais are said to have originated in this way. This habit of offering hospitality has been carried through to modern times, and while the nutritional importance of the food may decline in countries where the people are already well fed, the special nature of the teaching which is carried out at the dinner meeting has yet to be replaced. For those who are unaware of the highly structured and yet carefully calculated behaviour of the Sufi master at a dinner meeting, and this includes the majority of the Eastern people who have attended them, as well as Westerners. The whole transaction may look like nothing other than a jovial host entertaining guests. The major factor, which ordinarily escapes attendees, 
is that the dinner meeting above all is one at which indirect teaching takes place. Let us take an example, which may be duplicated, more or less, in any of a dozen such functions across the world. The teacher will usually begin his talk after all have fed. During the actual eating, he will perhaps talk to the few guests who have been invited because they have individual matters to discuss. These disposed of, the audience sits back to hear what topic has been chosen and to profit from its unfolding. Any resemblance between the Sufi meeting of this kind and the conventional religious meeting has to be noted. In the latter, a text or theme is taken and treated in religious and sometimes didactic terms. The emotions and the logical mind are both engaged. In the Sufi meeting, any topic whatever may be chosen, the intention being to bring to the consciousness of the individuals a way of thinking and a means of looking at things which is not available in their ordinary experience. The teacher may often range over all kinds of topics. Rumi's table talk is a good example of this in that it deals with local culture and problems. But there is a startling difference between the Sufi instructional meeting and any other kind of which we have any record. With the Sufis, if you find yourself applying the ideas expressed to yourself, you generally realize that you are being subjective. You can, in other words, find moral exhortations or formulae for running your life anywhere. Hence, we can immediately make a distinction between the Sufi teaching and didacticism. Equally, those seeking general principles soon realize how conditioned or pedantic they are. The Sufi will often pursue a course of thought and then switch over to the opposite seeming opinion simply to show you how fallacious or incomplete a single way of thought may be. It is impossible to escape the feeling that these people, in applying this expertise with such cogency and artistry, are doing something which cannot be found elsewhere. Many people, of course, attend such meetings and do not profit from them in the way outlined above. But especially in recent times, those who have been in touch, even by the written word, with Sufi activity, can find in the accounts of the actions and words of Sufi masters a wholly sufficient grounding enabling them to profit from any dinner meeting to which they are lucky enough to be invited. The test of whether one has profited or whether one still needs some concentrated study of the published paradigms of this kind of event is whether one's horizons have been widened by following a new or unusual point of view given by a Sufi. Some people have held that the mere fact of attending such meetings develops in the individual capacities which result at the appropriate time, in illumination. There is a certain story about this, repeated in dervish circles. There was once a dervish who found himself at the gates of heaven, following a long line of people. When his turn came to enter the gates, he paused to be identified and tested. The angel in charge said, What is your name? The man gave it. Then he asked the angel, Do I come in because of your having my name on a list? No, said the angel. You come in because you answer in the manner acquired by the pupils of such and such a master. But, asked the perplexed man, As I am not illuminated, how is it that I can enter heaven at all? This is possible, said the angel, because once the vegetable has been put in a pot and parboiled, there is no great problem in finishing the process. Sheikh Hamdun of Damascus summarized the matter for me in the following words. The purpose of Sufi study and development of being is, among other things, the establishment and maintenance of a way of thinking and perception which prevents the recurrence of primitive thought and action including the predominance of the reward-punishment mechanism and indoctrination, instead of merely having secondary aspirations, as with all other institutions, however fundamental or even vital 
these may be. Making Sense of Sufi Literature, Experts, Paradox Andrew C. C. Ellis Before I went to the Middle East on an extended visit to seek for answers to certain problems which I had extracted from a close study of publications on the Sufis and Sufism, I made it my business to meet as many predecessors, previous travellers and students, as possible. They were a remarkable assorted collection of people. This I decided through looking at them from the viewpoint of a trained sociologist with an interest in psychology. It is not to say, however, that many of them found each other to be so different. They tended, on the whole, to view one another through the eyes of the committed. Was the other person displaying similar preoccupations? Had he or she visited the same people? Of whom did they approve, and of whom did they disapprove? These attitudes, it seemed to me, left something to be desired. That something was that if we were to be able to extract useful materials from the immense body of literature and current Sufi action, it would be necessary to suspend opinion and, to adopt a frequent Sufi admonition, see facts. In the event, I was to see that there was a remarkable consensus among Eastern Sufis in this matter. They almost always made a point of stressing that the people whom I had met, even though claiming impressive credentials as disciples of so-and-so, were to be regarded as failures for the moment. This is the phrase which indicates someone who, in his spiritual studies, has got only to the point of seeking friends and enemies, following limited categories, looking for certainty and not the way to find certainty. I had noted something similar in groups studying Sufism in the West. Many made no progress precisely because they were too anxious to progress. Also, they were looking for social support or endorsement of their beliefs and other things which are not the fare at the Sufi table at all. On the other hand, there were distinct signs that Sufi ideas and knowledge were penetrating into the West, and that this was being done in a way which betokened a powerful understanding and considerable ability, located somewhere and directing the effort. My visit to the East, to the Arab, Turkic and Iranic areas, as well as to the Indian subcontinent, was because I found, in the West, representatives of a Sufism which I could glimpse only dimly through the documents and commentaries presented to us by the Orientalists, the specialists. It was even less visible in the words and behaviour of a great number of supposed Sufis who flourish in the West and hotly denounce the kind of Sufi teaching to which I have alluded, and which alone seems really interesting. The other, unfortunately, is only a rehashing of a sort of half-baked religiosity, of which there is probably quite enough in the West already. Nothing in it is new, nothing is in any way superior to the monkery of the Christian Middle Ages. Amusingly enough, I, and other observers, had noted that it was the essentially sincere but as essentially misguided enthusiasts who were in fact quasi-monks in the old and distorted mould, who most appealed to the traditional, old-fashioned, religious thinkers of the West. It was poets and scientists, businessmen and housewives, high achievers and ordinary people, who were interested in what some of us had come to regard as an important and intriguing display of real knowledge from the East. The others, the specialists in religion and Orientalism, could not, or would not, see it. I was afforded facilities to visit and live with Eastern Sufis under definite conditions. In the first place, I was not to journalise the materials. I was not to look at the outward face of things and make any play in any publication of local cultural matters, since these would not apply to me as a representative of another culture. 
I was not to engage in political, economic, or religious activity of any kind, apart from observing the rights of whatever might be my own religion. I was not to identify individuals and places. I accepted all these limitations not only with resignation, but with relief. After all, when you read much sociology, you realize that you are in fact reading polemic. When you read so much anthropology or travel literature, you can see that you are being treated to opinion or self-display. I was more than contented to go, to see, to feel, and to collect facts. I was also hardly less delighted to find, on my return with my materials, that the approach was welcomed by academic colleagues. So I cannot say that I have been a martyred worker, misunderstood and unsung. The paper by Abdul Wahab Tirmizi, The Dinner Meeting and Other Topics, excellently well provides an introduction to the sort of material for which I was searching. His account, which I find accurate in every particular, may be called a classic example of how something, the dinner meeting, can be on view and available to all, but can easily be swept aside as something of no consequence. Again and again in the Middle East, I saw Western invitees and scholars wearily waiting for the dinner talk to be over, so that they could ask about rituals, about personal preoccupations, about anything under the sun except the substance of the meeting itself, attention to which would have rendered their questions unnecessary. But there is more. Were there not, I would have to let Tirmizi's remarkable paper stand for my entire experience. A study of major standard Sufi documents, C.F. Hujwiri's revelation and Attar's recapitulation, shows that a very important part of Sufi teaching centers around examinations of the behavior, words, and activities of Sufi masters. These have almost always been mistaken for hagiographies, pious external propaganda, of the kind which was used in the Middle Ages to impress monks and laymen alike. The clue to their esoteric importance, however, even for the unwarned, is that we also find that Sufi teachers themselves, when retailing this information, act as if they were themselves uninformed observers. In other words, they have distanced themselves from the material and are presenting it almost, but not quite, through the eyes of the student. It thus can have a powerful teaching effect just as when a good teacher in any more profane subject adopts the stance of the learner, but brings to the selection, impact and projection of his materials the expertise which his knowledge makes possible. The materials, therefore, are not hagiographies, and we find them in use in a dynamic way, which would surely completely bewilder an Orientalist or other scholar innocent of this specialized usage, in living Sufi groups. If, however, the materials are simply read out by self-appointed students or teachers and do not form a part of the measured projection of a legitimate Sufi school, they will operate only on the lower level, producing low-level results, mere consumers of wonders. This remarkable application of the secret protects itself principle by the Sufis is one of the most impressive new factors which we in the West have to learn. The books are not, as we have noted, hagiographies, but further than that, today's Sufis are actually revealing in so many words that their histories and collected anecdotes or travels are in fact teaching documents which can be understood only by those who will forego the pleasures of wonderment and sentimentality. They are, in short, a part of a very highly sophisticated study system. As one Sufi put it to me, when I asked how we were supposed to be able to tumble to this fact, after all, if you style yourself an engineer and gaze in wonderment at the admittedly impressive symmetry of gears and ratchets, and if you construct a whole metier around this, and if you come to us asking to be shown more wonderfully balanced ball bearings, how are we, 
if we are engineers, to break into the realm which you have closed off in your minds, the realm where these things actually operate for a purpose, work as mechanisms. I had no answer, and I fancy that other scholars have none either. And yet it must be conceded that the Sufis have been trying to make engineers of us. For this reason, indeed, they have since the 1960s, about 20 years, given admittedly limited but nonetheless valuable access to facilities which they operate in several centres where these things are well understood. Certain suitable travellers have been selected, and teachers of the genuine law have encouraged them to familiarise themselves with the gears and bearings of the system. They have, too, allowed a certain amount of publication of these materials. So here we come across yet another Sufi paradox, which is baffling only, as the Sufis never cease to remind us, because we have blanked out what they have said. The paradox involves the fact that a book by a non-Sufi, for instance the late Professor Arbery's Sufism, which is alleged and believed to convey what Sufis teach, cannot in any sense be a teaching book. Yet, on the other hand, a book by a Sufi or sponsored by a real Sufi source, one such is undoubtedly O. M. Burke's Among the Dervishes, is a book from which one can learn, though looking like, and operating also as, a travel book with great entertainment content. The above knowledge has led, of course, to a profound re-examination of books by and on Sufis and Sufism, which are available in so many languages, notably English. It also allows for the republication of texts and commentaries and all kinds of other materials, such as a dervish textbook and the collection The World of the Sufi, recently issued by the Octagon Press, because with new instruments of study supplied by new knowledge of ancient processes, really useful instructional materials can be extracted from them by people who understand the way in which they work. It may be noted that Dr. R. E. Ornstein has supplied one way in which this material may be approached in relation to brain function. Professor L. Lewin has already published hints along this line, and there are other materials to be seen from time to time in specialist journals and monographs. Familiarity with the above-named materials and approaches explains how R. L. Thompson has been able to relate the Sufi contribution to contemporary science. By implication, of course, other current materials by run-of-the-mill specialists, Orientalist scholars, those interested in religion and esotericists, are seen to be inadequate and skating upon the surface, however profound they purport to be. There is little wonder that some otherwise respectable and well-established conventional authorities with excellent apparent credentials so easily join the jealous mad monks of the Sufic lunatic fringe in attacking this approach, which Shah has done so much to serve with his remarkable books. What is, however, gratifying and surprising in its generosity is the fact that so many scholars have shown themselves able to adapt to the new knowledge, which, in fact, negates so much of their work. Aphorisms of a Sufi Teacher Hilmi Abbas Jamil Cults and narrowly based systems always attempt to reduce the range of thought and activity. People working within non-cultic systems, for instance educational ones, also tend to develop cultish, narrowed-down attitudes. For example, they will tend to concentrate on only one or more aspects of the undertaking, the ones which please them most and will at that point reduce their capacity for learning and progress. Aphorisms, when they emanate from a source of knowledge and teaching, are not only entertaining and insightful, they widen the perspective, 
so that the individual can better see his or her previous limitations and hence overcome them. In current Sufi schools, a number of aphorisms are in use which clearly emphasize and illustrate this process. We shall take them one by one. There is no such thing as almost a Sufi, is the first. This is because Sufi stands for the product, the result, not the effort. The aphorism is intended to remind people that they cannot choose bits and pieces from Sufi practices or ideas and try to apply them without entering into a program which is, after all, designed to develop a skill, the skill of being able to do, be, and know. The saying is also used as a test. People who think that it means that they should become obsessed with becoming Sufis are unsuitable for Sufi study while they remain in that state of mind or hold that opinion. Imagination and intellectuality are the Sufism of the ignorant. The phrase alludes to the two instruments automatically reached for by people who want to approach something from a basis of ignorance. The imaginer, for instance, faced with a desire for riches, may fantasize how he might get them. The intellectually oriented, faced with an artistic work, may try to analyze it. Each of these types can obtain something from his effort, but he will not obtain what is really resident in the object of his approach. The effort has been attenuated by the procedure used. Similarly, any public library will provide you with books written on Sufism and Sufis which are packed with the imaginings or mental automatism of the writers. This is the Sufism of the ignorant, where ignorant means trying to portray something about which one really knows very little. Sufism is indeed teaching, but not all students are learners. Here we see the emphasis placed upon the fact that people who imagine that they are trying to learn may well be only trying to entertain themselves without knowing it. In all educational efforts there are such people, such as the perennial student, who is still studying many years after he should have learnt. Learning how to learn is even more important than learning itself. Without the former, the latter may exist, but it is out of reach. People ask what Sufis are doing for the world. They would do better to wonder whether, without the Sufis, there would still be a world. This is an ideal context-expanding sentence. Whether or not the Sufis are responsible for making the world tolerable or maintaining its existence, people who query Sufi usefulness have rarely thought whether they could recognize a Sufic operation in the world if they met it. They have narrowed their range to a crude vision of a world where the Sufis should have removed all the things which the questioners find objectionable. You do not need the name, pedigree or knowledge of the eating habits of someone who is saving you from drowning. The need to approach all kinds of study only from relevant questions and to suppress irrelevancies is immediately apparent here. This aphorism needs little explanation, but it does need to be thought about. Very little training is offered by any extant society in the approach to learning needed to maximize its effect. When I first looked at my teacher, I saw a man. Later, I saw no man, only knowledge. Again, the approach from the outside. If you recall how people whom you have met struck you, you will tend to remember superficialities. The person was impressive or disappointing, smiled or frowned, was rich or poor, old or young, pleasant or unpleasant. The teacher, on the other hand, is not a circus clown or babysitter. He or she is, for the student, a source of learning. Sufism does in twenty or thirty years what humanity will do in twenty or thirty thousand. 
This is intended to offer a suggestion of perspective to overcome impatience. It is also meant to indicate that the Sufis are aiming for a maturation of all humanity, not for the development of a clique. The phrase is also used for diagnostic purposes. People who think that it is an example of haughty pretensions may be labelling themselves as something like paranoid. Metaphysics may drive people mad. This would be serious if everything else did not drive even more people mad. Sufism, in fact, drives many people sane. It is true that many people interesting themselves in spiritual matters are abnormal. So are many people interested in strawberry jam. In order to establish whether metaphysical interests are undesirable, surveys would have to be made. First, the number of mad people in other fields would have to be established. Then the number of mad metaphysicians who were mad before they became metaphysicians should be assessed. And, of course, the definition of madness should be carefully established. Not so long ago, people who thought that the earth was round were assumed to be mad. Nonsense is quite often something which people cannot credit, not something which is really impossible. The British Astronomer Royal, according to Arthur C. Clarke in 1973, is stated to have said in about 1956, space travel is utter bilge. This is why the next aphorism in our selection has come into being. It is not learning which demolishes Sufis, it is stupidity. The Sufi enterprise is dedicated to asking the right questions. Sufis, when they teach, do not do so from doctrine or ignorance. They only teach what they know. This means that they organize their teachings to help to carry people from where they are to where the Sufi has already been. It is for this reason that they have the phrase, Sufis are people who will help you to ask the right question just as often as they provide the means to the right answer. This tendency to think of Sufis as people who repair the damage done to people by ignorance and assumptions about what can and cannot be done or experienced has caused some to say, sometimes approvingly, sometimes derisively, that Sufism is a hospital before it is anything else. Commenting on this, a contemporary Sufi has asserted, If Sufism is a hospital, the ordinary world is a mortuary. Life in the ordinary world trains people to live and to work, to operate and to learn, only in certain ways directly connected with a small range of ambitions and desires. Some of this training helps to vitiate the higher ranges of perception, and people on the Sufi path have to reclaim their sensitivity to subtler ranges of perception. He who tastes knows, they say, following the great Sufi Jalaluddin Rumi. But to this we have to add the aphorism which states the present problem. Taste some things and you lose the power to taste others. The experience of the Sufis, in fact, leads to an understanding of the human condition relating to what one can learn and achieve. Although obvious to those who know it, the resultant aphorism is, like all truths, hard to stomach for those who do not want to learn and may at the same time imagine that they do. The Sufi way may be difficult, but what if other solutions are impossible? Three forms of knowledge, according to the Naqshbandi, or designer's, school. By Gustav Schneck. Note. Formerly called Silsila i Kwajagan, Succession of the Masters, it is probably the earliest of all mystic Silsilas. The chaotic state of most people's conception of knowledge is seen in the fact that the word knowledge means all kinds of disparate things. There is the knowledge which comes from experience, the knowledge of a theory, knowledge of facts, and so on. 
one word but several different conditions and substances being described. The Sufi needs to make a distinction which other people may not feel necessary. Because he is approaching the fine from the course, he needs, like all specialists, more precise definitions than are needed at lower levels of understanding. Approaching the question in the terms familiar to ordinary people, the Sufi description is of three kinds of knowledge which have to be separated and the difference has to be felt. 1. The description of something, as in the words used to convey the idea of a fruit. 2. The feeling of something, as when one can see, feel and smell a fruit. And 3. The perceptive connection with something, as when one takes and tastes, eats and absorbs a fruit. These three departments of cognition are described in more technical language as 1. Certain knowledge, ilim al-yakin, which comes from the intellect, which tells us that there is a fruit. 2. Eye of certainty, ayn al-yakin, which is from the inner eye and operates like the senses but in relation to deeper things, the assessment of a fruit. And 3. Perfect truth, haq al-yakin, which is the experience of union with truth. The equivalence of these three areas in familiarly religious terms is 1. Acceptance of divinity as a statement, or intellect. 2. Feeling that there is divinity, or emotion. 3. Perceiving divinity, or understanding real experience. According to the Naqshbandi path, the following four stages of aspiration have to be passed through in readjusting that part of themselves which has perceptive capacity. 1. Desiring things for oneself. 2. Desiring things for others. 3. Desiring what should be desired. And 4. Being free from desire. The purpose of the teacher is to guide the learner from one stage to the next. Greedy people remain at the stage of desiring things for themselves only and cannot make the transition, in many cases, to wanting things for others. When they do reach this stage, which can happen with conventional idealists and the pious, they still have to detach from the desire to desire things for others in order to give themselves pleasure for this is only a form of stage one. This is the point at which the conventional moralist can only appeal for non-selfish service. He will generally not have the means to teach it, and hence most religious systems suffer from what they freely admit is vanity. Their constant battle against this, whether it has results or not, absorbs energy and lasts for whole lifetimes as we know from the records left by saints and others fighting temptations of all kinds. Abstinence or generosity are not virtues if you enjoy them or enjoy suffering through them. Pahudin Naqshband, first teacher of the Naqshbandi stream. The third stage, that of desiring what should be desired, comes when the previous barrier has been overcome. It signals the awakening of knowledge because it is then understood that what should be desired is more important than desiring itself. This paves the way for the fourth stage when the individual is able to detach from desire itself. Since he or she is now able to enter a non-desire state, the actions of a higher will, thy will be done, may become manifest. Certain spiritual systems, possessed of a tradition as to the overweening importance of this stage but evidently lacking the means to monitor and assist progress towards it, are characterized by striving to enter and stay in a non-desire state. The result is a large number of people in a quietist condition. They have not reached the stage of ability to detach, but the state of the inability to do anything else which rather than spiritual, it is possible to describe as a conditioning in apathy. 
This condition comes about because the previous stages have not been successively passed through.